everyone to the third episode of Stellar Sound Podcast. I am so excited to introduce our guest for today, Alexandra Denda. Alexandra is a Serbian artist that has worked with musicians from all over the world and has created gorgeous music, some of which can be found in her EP Dreamer, an EP that combines elements of neo-soul, jazz, world music, and electronica. Join us as Alexandra speaks about her experiences as an international musician living in New York, her vocal group Rosa, her creative process in creating Dreamer, and how she has continued making music and collaborating in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. This interview is just a peek behind the curtain into the mind of a wonderful musician. So please hop on and go stellar with us. did want to start out we have a tradition on the stellar sound podcast of our guests asking each other an icebreaker question so our previous guest Hanborn, had a question for you she would like to know what is your favorite ice cream oh this is actually this is so funny because this is what i ask my students when we really? have our first <laughs> lesson <laughs> I am, it's a tie between pistachio and tiramisu. Ooh, those are both, both yes. very interesting flavors. Yeah, that's that's the tie, yeah. Very nice. <laughs> that was a great question from Hunjorn, Ben. <laughs> yes, indeed. So do I now have to think of the question or can I uh, let you know about it a bit later? Yes, you can You can let me know. We'll, we'll give you the, the time of the podcast to think about it. Gotcha, doesn't gotcha. necessarily okay. have to be food related, whatever you would like. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> so you're in Serbia right now, but previously you were based in New York, correct? Yes, uh, I've, I was, I've been living in the States for the last 10 years. I was in Boston for three years and some change. Then I moved to New York, and at some point, I also lived in India for oh. four months, and then I, I came back to, to New York. And now, with this pandemic and everything, you know, once everything transitioned online, I decided mm -hmm. to be home for a couple of months just to use that time to be yes. with my family. Yeah. So. How long have you ba been back in Serbia? Uh, two months. Okay. A bit, so not bit too over long. two months. Yeah, not too long. I was I, I was staying optimistic. You know, yeah, that things are gonna open up. That something's gonna change. Yes. And then when winter came and the numbers just kept on spiking. Yes. Then I, and when ninety percent of my friends moved out of New York, mm -hmm. then I decided to take a break from from the city as well. Yes, I think this was a very rough winter for everyone, but mm. now we have the vaccines. Everything is getting a little bit warmer. Hopefully, exactly. hopefully we're on the upswing of all of this. Yes, exactly. That's what I'm looking forward to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you spent 10 years in New York. What was your experience like being an international musician living in New York? I feel in general, being an international person in New York, I, I, I think it's probably way easier there than anywhere else because, mm -hmm. you know, it's really a city of immigrants yes. or, or children of immigrants um so you know having an accent or you know having these cultural differences I've, uh, more often than not is perceived as as a plus rather than, yes. than something you know negative or 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 something to be reluctant or scared uh, scared of you know yeah um so and and also i think because there are so many musicians and so many international people then we kind of tend to gravitate towards each other and form alliances yes <laughs> in the story because we just have so so much in common music of course but then also just the the immigrant experience um so yeah just being a, a part of that vast community of international musicians has been extremely beautiful and, and fruitful and, and supportive because you know it's for me it's really just the awareness that you're not alone on a, on a boat mm -hmm. especially on a boat that's on a storm right <laughs> um really really 
you know, gives you a boost of motivation and confidence and, and, and hope. So yes, that's been great to be a part of that. That's really awesome. Is that, so I know that you helped co-found the vocal group Rosa. Mm -hmm. um, so this was the all female vocal ensemble with a mission to preserve and nurture the authentic form of tradition, non-tempered singing from Serbia. Is this yes. sort of pull towards other internationals, sort of what helped you, what inspired you to, to start this group? Or what is the story behind that group? I would say it actually started happening in the seed of that, I think was planted when I was at Berkeley. Cause um, I came to, when I came to Berkeley, my initial idea or fantasy was to study a lot of gospel music and soul and neo soul and R and B and a lot of like African American rooted types of genres, and to also start writing my own songs. Um, and that's something that was the mission that I came with. But then, when I did come to Berkeley, I was suddenly immersed in this extremely international community with people singing, playing traditional instruments and traditional music from the places that they came from, but also mixing it along with all of these contemporary and more westernized or just more pop popularized genres. And that just opened the whole world for me. So suddenly I was singing in a Mozambique fusion jazz uh, band, and then I was in a Indian ensemble. I was singing a traditional Bulgarian music, which was really, which culturally and geographically and, and aesthetically, it's very, very, very close to mine, to my culture and my traditional music from my, from my country. And so there was this burst of curiosity towards traditional music and also just how vast and diverse music can be, you know, especially mm -hmm. when you trickle it down to 12 notes. I mean, in you know, a lot of non-tempered and microtone music, you have more than 12 basic notes, but yeah, we're not gonna get, get there, <laughs> go there. Let's, 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 you know, stay in the Western state of mind and say, you know, like just what you can do with 12 notes mm -hmm. is amazing. And also as a singer of how, you know, your voice behaves differently, um, when it sings in a different language or when it sings a different genre, you just have to find a different color within mm -hmm. your voice to express, mm -hmm. to you know, stay in line with what that type of music is asking from you. So it was such an amazing journey of music, of expanding musicality. And then, you know, I feel like at some point you have to go full circle, which mm -hmm. for me was Rosa of like, oh, okay. Who am I? Where am Where am I coming from? What are my roots? I I want to go deeper into this. Yeah. Um, and and uh, and you know, like as Paulo Coelho says, when you really want something, the whole universe conspires to make it happen for you. Just like paraphrasing, but it did happen that way. So I was renewing like my my student visa while I was having like a work permit, like after I graduated, mm -hmm. and I remember. The website were soup, was super jammed, so I had a lot of issues trying mm -hmm. to get to the point where I can actually uh, finish all the forms and all of that and, and schedule an appointment, and I wasn't able to do so. And my friend told me, hey, I have a friend who actually managed to hack the system. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> like, she knows the way around it, because you have to use a back door in a way. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, and I connected with her, and she turns out to be a filmmaker who also studied traditional mu Serbian music and living in New York, and she was making a short documentary movie about the historical, cultural, political background, as well as, of course, you know, music history uh, background of this music. And mm -hmm. I started discovering arc like archives of this music and field recordings and, and songs and, and just aesthetics and vocal tones and just mm -hmm. expressions that I was absolutely unfamiliar with. I had no idea it was part of my heritage. So wow. then two of us, started brainstorming how amazing it would be to have a group like that in New York City. And then I reached out first to my network, 
So the mm -hmm. first set of the members was ba were basically my friends from Berkeley, mm -hmm. um, and they were all from all over. So it was kind of just inevitable that it's going to be an inter international group. And then yeah. slowly, you know, New York is such a transitional place. A lot of people come in, come out. So we had people going back home, and then we had to welcome new members. And then we started having open auditions, and we would really have mostly people from not the Balkans <laughs> come to audition. And then, you know, just the tradition of maintaining an international group remained. Wow. So, yeah, so in in seven years uh, that we've had the group, it's all going to be seven years this summer, we had people from Malaysia, India, um, Dubai, uh, Argentina, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Wow. Croatia, Greece, it's just, yes. <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah. So has it been like there's there's a set group of members or have you just sort of interchanged people as they come and go? We We tend to have a set group of members and then each member kind of has the song that they always lead. So mm -hmm. once we have the group, it's pretty set. But as I mm -hmm. mentioned, you know, it happens that somebody leaves New York or even leaves the, US, U, mm -hmm. the States or wants to de dedicate their time into something else. And then once we have somebody come out of the group, we always welcome somebody back in. We always want to maintain mm -hmm. a, between five and six members just to mm -hmm. ha keep nurturing that particular type of sound. Yes. You need to have at least, like I would say like four is the minimum. Mm -hmm. So we, we try to stay above that. Yeah. It's very cool. Have you all been able to stay in contact in the midst of the pandemic? And I'm sure that everyone sort of had to leave New York. Yeah, a lot of people left. So we, we're scattered over three continents right now. Mm -hmm. But we are managing to uh, maintain rehearsing online. And, you know, it's absolutely weird, with, especially with this type of music, where everything is about the blend and everything yes. is about like the way you connect but, you know, we try to, you know, you always try to find opportunity in diverse, in uh, adversity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, we're actually using this time to focus more on really intricate details when it comes to pronunciation, when it comes to certain melismas and, and mm -hmm. the feel and, and, and the way of like the, the rhythm feel, the groove feel as well, and the, the, the phrasing and, and all of these like super, super nitty gritty things yeah. that we usually wouldn't go so deep into. This is actually an opportunity, has been the opportunity to be doing so. So, you know, there's, there's a yeah. silver lining in everything. That's awesome. <laughs> That's really, really cool to hear that you're still finding ways to even find the good in this sort of mm. challenging time. Yes, I think it's just when there there is a difficulty, you just, you know, you have to split things into two. Mm -hmm. What are the things that you can affect and what are the ones that, are, that you cannot? Mm -hmm. And then just, you know, work with what you have. Yeah. And, and also try to, you know, see things from another angle because, you know, the... The circumstances change, so you cannot be expecting things or seeing the things from the same spot. You right. need to you need to move, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know. So your outlook and you see the things from a different prism, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I think that's the only way that you can really, you know, find some benefit from from a challenging situation. Yeah, I think honestly that's really inspiring advice for everyone to hear. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, you, you teach what you got to learn best. So. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>
and I w you know things that I would gravitate naturally towards that I would try to emulate and then after emulating trying to find my own sound around it but you know something that I was very intuitively drawn to with not mm -hmm. giving it much thought I think in the last couple of years I wasn't as you know, studious about listening to one particular artist yes. as much as I was when I was younger. I think it was just a, a different type of attention and curiosity that was, you know, um, happening back then when you're just forming your musical identity. Right. Now I think I'm a little, maybe a little bit more qu quantity over quality in that sense, the, uh -huh. the quality of listening. Yeah. Or just dedicating yourself so much towards that and actually I started I, I'm aware of that and I, I wasn't too happy about it so lately I've been going back to listening to albums mm -hmm. the way how it used to be yes because <laughs> <laughs> um, you know I feel like we can get easily sucked into this uh, single mentality mm -hmm. that we just Absolutely. listen to, you know and then we know an artist just by by one song or two songs and mm -hmm. then we really don't sit down to be aware of that their body of work so right. yeah so i've been i think for me it had to be a conscious choice lately to be mm -hmm. like hey i love this artist i've been listening to these three songs <laughs> like a crazy person <laughs> let me sit down and just really play an album from beginning till the end no shuffle no nothing yes. just to you know listen to the album the way the artist intended it for us mm -hmm. to listen to it like to follow their vision um yeah so when i go go back to those times i would say i was really really obsessed um with Jill Scott and Erica Badu, mm -hmm. um, Rochelle Farrell. I liked jazz when I was younger, but I really like I liked more of the modern stuff. I think yeah. as I got older, then I would kind of go back to the you know 40s and 50s, and I would I would enjoy me some Billie Holiday and Ella. Yeah. But back then, for me, it was like Diane Reeves and Rochelle Farrell. Uh huh. That's <laughs> so cool. Because I needed, I feel like I needed that. Uh, familiarity of the, the soulfulness that they had yes. and and then just the the harmony also that was more modern that mm -hmm. was not you know and and also I feel the groove feel that it was mm -hmm. more backbeat somewhat that was not so swing yes related because even now I like to listen to swing music but I cannot sing it in terms of like it's not that I don't know how to sing it but mm -hmm. I do not feel the need to <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so to say, you don't yeah. have that a attachment to it. Yes, exactly. And mm -hmm. and then also one more artist that I need to mention is and it's kind of under the radar, but it's been a huge influence on me has been um, Amela Ru. Oh, so when I heard her, I felt I found my 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 musical soulmate of a sort. <laughs> really? Because of the, especially like not just musical in terms of songwriting as well mm -hmm. just the way how she would craft words the things that she would talk about the way how she would use metaphors and her vocabulary but mm -hmm. also like she was like also an artist who would combine american folk but in a very like just a dash of it it's really mm -hmm. you know like how you have uh tones of a perfume it's just like at the yeah. very 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 bottom Mm -hmm. And then also these kind of, she would had these like very subtle, intricate Middle Eastern moments in the way how she would have her melismas, her vocal mm -hmm. runs and things like that. So mm -hmm. she was very, she was different, mm -hmm. very, very different and very authentic. And I think that authenticity of hers really spoke to me. So yes, at the moment I, I discovered her, I had a, like a whole Amela Rue phase. Yeah. <laughs> <my life. laughs> So I've actually never heard of Amela Rue, uh, but just the, hearing you describe her, I'm really thinking of your song from your Dreamer EP, the, the Dreamer. Ah, uh, wow. That song. Yes. <laughs> which is my personal favorite from that EP. And kind of a lot of what you just described is what I love about that song so much. Can you tell mm. me a little bit about your creative process for coming up with that song? Yes. So uh, usually when it comes to writing music, I feel like I have two ways how to go. It's usually everything comes together, like mm -hmm. melody, 
and and words they just come together to me almost like I'm downloading it from some kind of a inspirational cloud um, and you know and usually because these mel melodies are so well articulated it it's a no-brainer when you have to figure out the harmonic language of, of, of that song mm -hmm. but um, and then there's this other way that's and that's the story of dreamer was I remember having this progression that I have in the beginning, that those three chords, dum, 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 the C, D flat to E flat to C. Mm -hmm. And I just liked it, but I had no idea what to do with it. So yeah. I was just like playing around with it and like working out melodies in my head, but nothing was singable. You know, everything sounded like a solo, nothing, you mm -hmm. know, like an improvisation. I, I was not getting to a melody. Mm -hmm. And then I let it sit, sit. you know, I said like, okay, this is great. I love this. I need to do something with this sometimes along the, <laughs> along the line, but mm -hmm. you know, I guess now it's not the time and some months actually passed. And then I had a, this was back at Berkeley and I had a lyric writing uh, class. And then we had to do an exercise where basically you're using um, the principle of object writing, but instead of describing an object, you need to describe a person. And then my best friend had to leave school due to some financial difficulties. So I was missing her a lot and I was wondering what, whether she would come back. So I started mm -hmm. writing about her. And that's how the first lines of, I used most of from what I got from that exercise, I put it into the first verse. Um, and then when I wrote that, I, it kind of clicked to me that that would work, that those words would somehow have to work with that progression that I had. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to it and then I remember starting like trying to figure out melodies around the words that I had and just like working out the rhyme scheme and just playing around with that. You know, it's kind of a back and forth. And then it started clicking and I remember hating it. <laughs> Being really? like, this is cheesy. I don't. I don't think I like this. You know? Oh my gosh! <laughs> but then I and you know, so I was stuck with these three chords, and I said, okay, this has to go somewhere. And then I started developing more of like harmonic language, and then that melody, da, 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 and mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I actually like this. I, the previous part I did not like, but now I like this. So let's let's see where uh. this takes me. And then the chorus came in, and I really, and that's when the words for the chorus and the melody came mm -hmm. in. And I said, okay, I actually, I like the chorus. Let me, I'm going to, I'm going to feel okay hating the verse right now. And then <laughs> let me just finish the song. And then I'm going to rewrite the things that I don't like. Yeah. So let me just develop, let me develop the lyrics of the second verse. Let me see if I want to bring in the, the, the bridge or anything. And the song did not have a bridge. So I was just playing it like that. And it was actually slower than it is on the record. And then I brought this song to my producer and we created one arrangement for it and then at some point we were like no this is not working and then he decided to speed it up a bit mm -hmm. and the song suddenly totally got a different life because you know moving the tempo i think it was like five to seven bpms mm -hmm. suddenly suggested a different groove and the melody was moving differently and now you know it was also shorter in terms of timing Mm -hmm. I said, okay, we need a bridge. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and then the bridge came in as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was definitely a long process and, you know, how we would f do one thing would kind of affect what happens next. Mm -hmm. I feel it was this kind of a chain reaction or kind of a butterfly effect <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> with this song. One thing would, you know, affect the, the next. Um, so it took a while. And then also we decided to, um, uh, include apart from having a live band to have a string string section um and then a little bit of electronics as well so it was this it turned out to be this cool hybrid of you know electronic and acoustic elements and I, i'm yeah. now i'm super happy like for me and i'm so happy to hear that this is your favorite song because now this is one of the songs that i hold really dearly to my heart but it, it's so funny you know i did not like it the that is crazy to hear <laughs> Well, and it's so yeah. satisfying for me as a listener to actually get to hear what you were thinking and who you started writing about because it tells such a story. And so I was just sitting there thinking like, is this about herself? Is this about someone that she knows? And so this is so, I, I feel like I'm, I'm in on the joke now. I feel like I got to, to sort of look behind the curtain and see what's happening behind mm. the song. 
and I'm so excited to go after the after this interview is over to go and listen to it again, <laughs> knowing all of this. Yeah, you're gonna probably gonna hear it with you know new ears. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> I, no, I thank feel... you for asking. I mean, I know I don't. I tend to talk a little bit about my songs when I perform, but I never have a chance, you know, to really go so deeply yeah. into explaining the breaking down the process. So, so thank you. It's it's exciting yeah. for me to, no, to speak about it. So exciting to hear everything. just like to take a brief moment to talk about our partner, Kets. Kets is a handmade jewelry company based in Serbia. Kets uses recycled materials to design and create new and fresh products that are easy to wear and combine. They're perfect for those seeking simplicity with an attitude. I invite you to please check out their website, Kets.rs, that is K-E-T-Z dot R-S, and redesign yourself. a bit um, before you had mentioned that you ask your students about their favorite ice cream so you are balancing your career as a performer and also as a music educator how how do you do that how, how do you balance the two I mean I feel in or it has been the case for most of my friends in in the states that you know, when you're starting out, you really need to have a day job in order to maintain a life in, mm -hmm. in New York City or just in States overall. And um, I, I did have different types of jobs uh, once I got out of school. First one, one of them, first of them was working for a nonprofit that was bringing music education um, to, I would say like um, communities at risk. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it was, you know, you ha you're working in your office and you know you're working towards a higher, uh, how would you say, um, not a higher calling, but just, you know, you're bringing some, you're working to, towards some change, uh, yeah. but you're, you know, but you're not really, f hand you don't have any hands-on experience, you right. know, while, while doing so. Right. Um, and I, f I felt that I was missing that. Um, and, you know, kind of going back to that awareness, okay, I, I, I would need, I'm gonna need time to build this music career for myself and I need to have a day job. It might as well be in music. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started applying for a lot of jobs when moving to, to New York, cause this job was uh, while I was still in Boston. And mm -hmm. um, the first call that I got was to be a teacher. So it was, you know. <laughs> It was meant yeah. to be, I guess. Uh, but I did, I did teach before even studying at Berkeley. I remember also when I was a kid, a lot of my teachers would send me kids that were, you know, problematic or had like mm -hmm. issues with with ear training or music theory, and then they would come to my house and I would teach them, and I would bump their grades by one or wow. two marks, you know, and things like that. So, I, you know, going kind of back even to those days, I definitely had an act a knack for it you know, yeah. in a way um and then you know if one thing led to another and then i was really i ended up teaching a lot i mean that was the reason why i also went to india i over there i thought at a basically university level mm -hmm. and that was extremely gratifying and i feel and there's an interesting comparison between like the input and output when you look at you know your career as a as a writer or a performer and as an educator you know and when you're a musician and and a writer you know you're you're you have a very long period of input mm -hmm. you're investing ideas time energy effort frustration money yes <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
<laughs> a lot of a lot relationships, mm-hmm. relationship building, you know, skill building at the same time, and and you know the the output is really delayed, mm-hmm. and sometimes, um, unfortunately, more often than not, you have this. Uh, this proportion, this proportion between the input and the output, Mm -hmm. you know, like of how much you put in, how much you get out. Right. Um, Where in education, it's way more, it's faster. Like it's, Mm -hmm. you know, it happens several times during the lesson sometimes. And it's also this moment of, you know, you see what you implement in somebody else and, Mm -hmm. you know, you're, you are helping them reach greatness. And for me, music lessons are not just about getting better at music i think it's just getting better at life yeah <laughs> becoming absolutely. a better becoming a better person and you know the the better i was getting as an educator i i you know i started seeing how much i implement more of that into my mm-hmm. lessons and into the relationships that i build with my students and um it's really you're teaching them very important life skills you yes. know, you're teaching them to impress, uh, express themselves. You're teaching them to be authentic. Mm-hmm. You're teaching them to be curious, mm-hmm. and you know, and creative. And I think these are and and to have uh, about self confidence and mm-hmm. also how to handle frustration. I think these are some of the most important lessons in life that you can get. You know, yes. that you don't necessarily learn at school as it is. So. Yes, that's how I uh, that's how I see music education. Yeah, and as I said, I feel like I've kind of <laughs> accepted that you know I will have to be sitting on two chairs mm-hmm. <laughs> professionally, <laughs> and it definitely gives me more satisfaction when that other job is also in music, especially yes. working. I love working with young people. I love kids, um, and also in the, in that regard, when you know that you are helping someone. Yes better themselves and surprise themselves and achieve something that they did not believe they could mm-hmm. is it's it's such a rewarding thing yeah yes well it's really clear that you're very passionate about music education so i i think that a lot of people are benefiting from the fact that you have to have these these two chairs and <laughs> and be on both sides of it and so i i imagine that you're putting a lot of good into the world through all of your performances and music education. Thank you. I'm hoping so. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Have you been able to teach during the pandemic? Yes, I've been teaching mostly online. I mean, mm-hmm. it really depended on the family's preference as well as finances because mm-hmm. you know a lot of circumstances have changed. Absolutely. So I de- I'm definitely teaching less than I did like last year or the year before Uh (laughs) um but i'm i'm grateful that i managed to you know keep teaching and keep also you know providing for myself in in that way um and and actually you know it's also the same thing that i I talked about before you need to change your outlook and you also have to see you know there there's definitely been a lot of challenges especially with younger kids especially mm-hmm. with i also apart from voice i also teach piano mm-hmm. um so you know and for you not to be physically there to like play duets with them or you know mm-hmm. position help them position their hand or show them something that they can see you know from that point of view has been challenging right. but on the other hand i've st- kids are becoming so much more self-sufficient. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, how much, and just that self-reliance that they're also developing throughout this time. It's amazing. And a lot of them now, they they know better, you know, what kind of, what's for homework. I don't necessarily Mm -hmm. have to text their parents or tell them each time because they were so invested and, you know, so independent on during the lesson that Mm -hmm. they, you know, they have it. They know, they know what's up. Right. (laughs) Yeah, oh, that's so that's really great. You know, so there are some benefits, of course, as yes. I said, you know, there's two yeah. sides of every coin. Yes. I I love to hear how positive you are about all of this. Um it, this has been a challenge for a lot of people and you've seen several sides of this as a musician, as a collaborator, as a songwriter, as a performer, as a teacher and as someone who has seen and experienced all of this 
what would you say has been the general effect on the mental health aspect uh, for musicians and students? Uh, I mean, for for musicians, just the fact that, you know, just this one year of silence, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, has been really, really hard. You are basically forbidden mm -hmm. <laughs> from from doing your job. Or, you know, you can do it in, you know, I did some virtual concerts and, and things like that. And I remember the first time I, when I met with one of my friend's piano players and we played together, just the physical sensation that I had of like hearing an instrument and making music with another human being, there was just this mm -hmm. extra gratitude about being able to do that and yes. just uh, like how blessed we are that we can do that. Yes. Uh, and you know, that's, and, and that's also how much I, when I really realized of how much it did affect it, affect it, how much it affected me that I did not do it for so long. You know, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are very adaptable beings. So, the, you know, for the first three weeks, it's hard. But then after three, four weeks, we adapt to this new setting. And we don't even, I feel like for, for most humans, we need to at some point look back and realize how much it has affected us rather right. than knowing it in the moment. Right. Um, you know, so I feel like there's a lot of different sides to the difficulties that the situation brought to to the musicians i i would mm -hmm. say the first one is possibly the economical one you know you mm -hmm. you don't have the means to provide for yourself in a ways that you used to mm -hmm. um and you know the the trickiest thing is also you don't know when that's going to change mm -hmm. so i think you know um having a deadline or having an idea of an expiration date of something, you know, especially of a hard period really mm -hmm. helps you, you know, the moment. And that means you have when something has an expiration date, you know that after the expiration date, you have something to look forward to. Yes. So and now we have we possibly have something to look forward to, but it's not dated. So I think right. just the way how that's set up, it's really hard mentally to cope with. Absolutely. Um, and so we, you know, there, there's that thing, the economical thing, but also mentally how you're dealing with, with that, um, economical hurdle. Cause you don't know, mm -hmm. okay, I have this amount of savings, how much, is, you know, like I can mm -hmm. survive for X amount of time, but is that going to be enough? Right. So there's just this, you know, you're surrounded with uncertainty in, in many, in many ways. Um, mm -hmm. and then, you know, the fact that you cannot do things, that you know you know how to do that makes you happy and that also brings a mm -hmm. particular physical sensation to you you know just, yes. you know you know speaking of economical we have the mental the, the emotional but also the physical aspect mm -hmm. of of doing music or of making music um that i'm sure it's you know affecting us uh, you know, on that, those levels as well um mm -hmm. so it's yeah it's definitely been complicated for me i also i started thinking about okay if this is going to last for god knows how long i need i need a plan b right and i and then i remember seeing that um poster that would that you know had a lot of backlash in in the uk yes <laughs> the, like the ballerina <laughs> yes so it's just you know suddenly a whole branch of economy mm -hmm. is has turned dry and you know mm -hmm. we're like little birds sitting on that branch and yes. trying to figure out okay do we stand here and then go down with this branch or do we fly onto the next branch <laughs> right but then you have such but... a, a terrifying thought that comes with that is that well if the musicians go away and switch careers then where's the music mm. yes uh, definitely or just the, wh what's the future of music you know because mm -hmm. it's probably gonna stay but in how it's gonna transition that's um, yes that's a question because now you know virtual concerts are being introduced there is a huge chance that that becomes some kind of a new standard or mm -hmm. you know like an like an extra thing right you have mm -hmm. a concert but you also have a live stream right. things like that um AI is expanding and going right. everywhere. So, you know, there's already AI making music mm -hmm. and we're just, we haul, and I'm going to get dark, but just, you know, we haul as a humanity, we're 
every, everything that's happening, a lot of things that are happening are moving towards our integration with technology. Yep. On a biological level almost. Yes. Yes. So, you know, there's um and and our industry is the one that's been in a very bad place for a very long time for the last mm -hmm. 10 20 years. Mhm. Mm and, and it's the one that's really adaptable. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's the one that changes the most along with some other ones. So, you know, there are a lot of question marks there, but I think, you know, and that's now the, you know, the dark side. So, um, but I think it's, you know, you have to go back and f find a mindset that's productive for you, right. for yourself. Right. You know, yeah. so whatever, and, and you know, it, it's probably different for everybody, but I feel acceptance and patience, it's something that's always, yes. you know, that's never going to do you wrong. Yes. <laughs> well, and I think that so far, uh, I, so far in this interview, you've done a really good job of pointing out that these challenges have led to innovation and creativity, and there's a lot of and good doing things differently. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. And as scary as an unsure future is, I mean, the online opportunities have provided a lot of accessibility. And I imagine that you've probably also experienced there are some students who are now able to get lessons from you because they don't have to be in the same physical room as you. Exactly. Yes. I have students from Canada. I have some students in Europe and other places in the States as well. So mm -hmm. yes, yes. As I said, you know, you have to go back and find positivity and then, yes. you know, see new opportunities and then find, find a path to make them happen. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. You know, cause, um, if we get locked in the things that we cannot do right now and the things that we cannot do anything about, it's a mm -hmm. very daunting place. Yeah. And it's a very dark place mentally. Mm -hmm. And then, you, you know, you just keep sinking down, but, um, yeah, you have to, yeah stay you know stay on the surface yes and keep swimming and keep swimming do you have any advice or wishes for musicians that are currently struggling with all of these fears and uncertainties um i for me what works is taking it day by day mm -hmm. and uh, making plans and having things to look forward to, mm -hmm. but not have solid deadlines or dates when it has to happen. Right. So, you know, so you are, you know, you keep, you keep your dream alive, you keep working towards things, but you have that acceptance uh, or flexibility that, okay, I'm not sure when this is going to happen, but once yes. it does, I'm going to be ready. Yes. And, and, and then you keep on doing things once a day if you can that just brings some kind of joy for you mm -hmm. let it be as little as i don't know putting a sheet mask on your face yeah <laughs> or you know or like cooking something that you really like um yes you know little things like that i think just nurturing joy and 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 you know self-care mm -hmm. um i think it's really 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 important yeah and just absolutely. keep and, you know, always keep looking for opportunities because even when looks like there's no way out, mm -hmm. I feel w if your energy is in the right place and when you're, mm -hmm. you are putting effort in the right place, mm -hmm. something needs to open. Yes. And as, as we've talked about, it, the opportunities are there. They just look different right now. Bravo. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you summarize it. You summarize it perfectly. Yes, yes, yes. So, but you have been able to make music at least a little bit during this time because you have a new song being released soon, right? Yes, actually, again, as you mentioned, I, I use this time to, as, as you mentioned, that other people has, have an opportunity to study with me that otherwise probably wouldn't i mm -hmm. i use this time to also collaborate with people that are not in the same physical places as as yeah. i am That's so cool. i i recorded three new songs and so one of them we had um a drummer in Mal from malaysia my co-writer and another singer on a song she's currently in abu dhabi 
uh, the, one of the producers was in New York, the other one is in LA. So there's been a lot of this collaborative spirit that's been going on. Mm -hmm. And you, and this was like one of the songs was finished during the worst moments <laughs> in the <laughs> pandemic, like wow. in between, I'd say like April and May, April and oh, June, wow. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm right now I am honestly weirded out how we managed to do so. Yeah. <laughs> but we, but we, what we did. And, and also like the, that song that we wrote, um, was about our friendship. So it was something that was really my friend that's currently in Abu Dhabi. It was something that was really rela relatable and kind of unshaken by mm -hmm. the situation that we were in. It was kind of our constant, you know, like yeah. the world is melting, but <laughs> you know, we still have each other kind of a thing. Um, yes. So it was, you know, it was, uh, I, I'm happy that we managed to make it happen. And also everybody else was, so nice and understandable about finances around that time mm -hmm. and just you know being being super open in in right. that sense to collaborate which was a gift so yes so cool. i'm happy i'm happy we made made that happen and you know again that was uh, going back to that when i'm in new york I'm teaching, I'm rehearsing, I have a gig, mm -hmm. I have a this this event, I have that event, uh, you know, he, gazillion things. And mm -hmm. your mind is cluttered and your schedule is cluttered. And yes. I rarely, I, you know, I do get inspired, but I rarely have the luxury of time and brain space to yeah. really sit down and create and write and be in, in, in that place. I, mm -hmm. I, I usually do that when I go on a retreat or when I go into nature or something like that, that when, you know, all the distractions kind of fade away. Yeah. So this was, I think, again, it was me kind of seizing that opportunity of, ah, suddenly there's silence. Okay. I don't have that much work. I'm terrified economically but I do have time. Let's see what I can do with it. Yeah. And you seize um, the opportunity. Yes. Yes. So I'm, I'm happy, you know, that that's, that's happened. And now, you know, the, once the creative part is over now, the, the, the tough part comes, which mm -hmm. is the business. So, yes. you know, I have a lot of hesitation of what, you know, is it like how and when and uh, how to handle releasing music during the pandemic? Is it smart mm -hmm. is it, or, is, you know, is it or right. not? And, and things like that. So let, let, let's see. <laughs> right. Well, I'm really excited for the release. Can you tell us anything Thank about you. what we can, what we'll hear in, in this release? So this one actually is not one of the songs that I mentioned. This is a, mm -hmm. this song has a different story. So on, on April 30th is International Jazz Day. Mm -hmm. And in the past years, I've had a tradition of performing on that date. And now because we won't have an opportunity to do so in person, I decided to release basically the only real, real jazz song that I ever wrote. <laughs> <laughs> That I had an opportunity to uh, record with a with a friend of mine, a wonderful guitar player from from Brooklyn, Asher. Mm -hmm. uh, so we managed to do like a live video. So I have an audio and a video of that, and it's just it's a very simple in instrumentation wise song. Um, so it's kind of my contribution for for International Jazz Day, um, and this this song is about. Um, I would say the fleeting love, fleeting love, you know, just um, the lo love that's, that's beautiful to look at, but it's impossible to grasp. Yes. It's kind of, you know, that has in between the lines, it's kind of this fear of commitment. I am so excited so. to hear what this <laughs> is going to sound like but it's such a re relatable feeling. Yes. I feel like we've <laughs> all been, you know, on one or the other side of it at some point in life. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. so excited to hear it. Thank you so much for, for coming on and talking about all of this. I feel, I, I feel so fortunate. I feel like I finally got to peek behind the curtain 
behind everything Aww. that goes on. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for thank you for having me and thank you for such insightful uh, questions. You know, I'm happy I got to, you know, share this part of, of me and my process and my story with you. Well, it's been absolutely wonderful for me. And before we leave though, we do need to ask you for an icebreaker question for our next guest. Mm. I mean, the other question that I ask my students is what's their favorite animal? So <laughs> <laughs> that is a great one. That can be that can be the question. Yes. What is your favorite yes. animal? Oof, I I adore dogs, but I also once I discovered this animal, I'm just fascinated by it. It's quokka. Mm. Oh, from Australia. They look like they're always smiling. <laughs> it's just Yeah. I think I've heard of Isn't that the world's happiest animal? Yes, that's how they that's how they brand it. But I, I, then I watch a documentary about it. It's not really it's not really. Oh. Like that. oh. They just look like that. <laughs> but it, it's just it's such a you know I really like unique and unusual things. So yeah. once I discovered it, I just yeah I definitely had a fascination with it. I love it. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, very great. Thank you so much again. Thank this you. Has been a wonderful time. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Stellar Sound Podcast. I would like to thank our Stellar Sound Podcast team for helping to create this episode and to especially thank our partner, Kets. If you like what you heard, please feel free to follow our Discord server, Instagram, Facebook page, and YouTube channel. We'd love to hear any and all feedback about how we can improve for our next rocket launch. See you then.